that uh, song, Stand By Me, play it tonight in honor of my very good friend, Andy Reynolds. Uh, Andy and I heard that song a number of times together and would give hugs and man, I love that guy and I miss him. Donna, I see you. Glad you're here. We love you and so glad you're here. All right. Um, and tonight we go back to work, folks. We move on and we get to work again for this democracy, for a better world. Um, so thanks everybody for coming tonight and uh, being here. We're going to just kind of wait another minute. Maybe if you could drop a word into the chat about uh, how you're feeling today. It doesn't matter what the word is, how you're feeling about our democracy today. Go ahead and drop a word in chat. That'd be great. I love seeing these come through. Optimistic, determined, fragile, for sure. Hopeful, ready, resolute, fired up. Frustrated, risky, got, I see, I hear it all. Impeach, hopeful, mixed, ready to work. Good trouble. Yep, yep, thank you all. This is great, these are great. Yep. Yeah, I see it confused in there. Yeah, a couple of those, yeah. Yeah, after watching the uh, defense attorney for Trump, very confusing. That dude. Um, so we're gonna maybe wait one more minute. I still see him, we will persist. Carolyn says, absolutely we will. So glad you're all here, so glad. Engaged, absolutely Lucy, 100%. Welcome tonight, everybody, to the Zoom. What are we going to do when we can go back in person? It's going to be so crazy. People will be like coming in and we'll be like hugging and hugging and giving high fives. Here, I'm going to get, we can do a high five right now, right there. Okay. Okay. High five, everybody. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. All right. That's a go team there that AJ introduced to our, for our organization. All right, welcome tonight. I'm gonna kick us off and get us going. Um, our agenda for this evening is, uh, I'm gonna say a little bit about how we got here in terms of our country to where we got to this HR1 bill that we're gonna support. Then Maggie Rittenhouse and Kylie Knowles are going to kind of tag team and talk a bit about the bill itself and also about why they are invested in this work. Uh, and then we will finish with that. I have a short video clip of John Lewis speaking about HR1, the previous version when it was introduced in 2019. And then we're going to do some Q&A. We'll start Q&A around 40 minutes after, 45 at the, at the latest. Um, so that's our agenda for tonight. So glad you're here. Let's get to work. I'm going to share a, a screen here. Okay. So... After Barack Obama, I'm gonna do a little bit of a, just a presentation here. After Barack Obama was elected in 2008, Republicans uh, made, they kind of adopted a position that they never wanted this kind of thing to happen again. A black man in the White House, six, almost 60 Democrats in the US Senate, 250 some seats in the US House. Um, and you remember Mitch McConnell infamously said that their primary job after 2008 was to make sure that Barack Obama was a one-term president. Well, Republicans, they have a playbook around voter suppression. They know what they're doing and how to do it. And they rolled it out in, in extremes after that. And so I'm gonna be doing a, two lectures in late March on voting rights and where we are as a country. 
Um, and so I really encourage you to check that out. We'll drop the link in here in the chat while we're going today because I just it's going to get announced uh, or it just was announced a couple of days ago. I'm going to start promoting it here. But here's five of the techniques that Republicans went all in on after 2008. They implemented a gerrymandering program in 2010 that we are still really hard trying to dig ourselves out of in this country. Okay. They implemented voter ID laws across this country in almost 30, I think 35 states today have voter ID laws in America. They began to cut the numbers of voting days that were of uh, early voting days that were out there in states that had made reforms and offered early vote opportunities in uh, North Carolina, uh, uh, Michigan, uh, Georgia. They began to cut days back, cut them back. They began to cut voting locations after the 2013 Supreme Court Shelby County versus Holder decision. Uh, they, they, they began to cut the locations and there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of voting locations cut and removed in this country. And they began to purge voter registration lists and remove people who didn't vote every federal election. And the Supreme Court has upheld all of these or said in the case of gerrymandering that there's nothing they can do about it. All right. This has been an incredible toolkit of voter suppression. And this is not randomly distributed. Republicans have targeted from the beginning Black Americans, Latinx Americans, young Americans, and lower income Americans, because these voters all vote Democratic in a society. And in the case of the first two, African Americans and Latinos, these are folks that deeply embedded in the, the kind of Republican worldview is, is the sense that these voters don't deserve to vote. They aren't real Americans. They aren't worthy of the, of the, the right to vote. So this voter suppression has been rolled out and was extremely effective for a number of years. But as I'll talk about in a, in a month and a half, there's also been a counter response by Democrats. And that counter response, and we've been part of it, has been so effective that the reality is that by the time we get to 2010, I'm sorry, 2018, the Democrats are making a move. And so let's look at voter turnout in 2018 and 2020 and look at the percent of the electorate that turned out to vote, even though all those laws are in place over there. But the Dems responded, progressive orgs responded and began to bring out their A game and get people out to vote. So here's the, the voter turnout midterm elections in our country over the last 100 plus years. You can see that in 2014, we had the lowest turnout since World War II. But in 2018, we had the highest voter turnout since 1914 in over 100 years. Because in the words of Stacey Abrams, massive voter engagement will beat massive voter suppression. It will. It can. In the presidential elections over the last 100 years, since actually the last 120 years, in this election, we had the highest voter turnout since 1900. In 120 years, the highest voter turnout that we've had. And common power was part of that. We gave it everything we had. You all, we all gave it everything we had. So we have been making progress. We have been fighting and overcoming voter suppression that is out there. But the Republicans have now approached, have now achieved another moment where they're like, we, we have to up our game. We need to implement even stricter voter suppression, even tighter laws, even more ridiculous and racist policies. So this is what's happening in state after state across this country right now. And we knew it was coming. This is not a surprise to us. We are now mobilizing to do all we can to overcome and to block this voter suppression turnout. So to give you a sense of just how hard Republicans are pushing right now, I want to quote from the Brennan Center at New York University. They track voting uh, rights and, and uh, suppression um, all over this country. And they just yesterday updated a report that they had implemented. They had introduced a report about a month ago in early January, and they updated it yesterday. And this is what they had to say. 
grounded in a rash of baseless and racist allegations of voter fraud and election irregularities. State legislators, as of February 8th, have introduced well over four times the number of bills to restrict voting access as compared to roughly this time last year. Four times more this year compared to last year. 33 states have introduced, pre-filed, or carried over 165 restrictive bills this year as compared to 35 last year in 15 states as of this day. 100 and 65 restrictive bills in 33 states, folks. 165 bills in 33 states. Every single one of them by a member of the Republican Party. Every single one of them. So we have two options. One, we will work state by state wherever we can. And we are researching how best to do this following the lead of our partner organizations. That's one option. And two, the one we're here to talk to you about tonight is to push for federal legislation, federal legislation that would override state activities. That's what we can do. And so these stakes could not be higher if Democrats do not pass federal voting rights legislation in the next year and a half, then we are in a world of hurt for our democracy. So we're in, we're in and we're on. I'm all in, we need to be all in. There's no guarantee of success, but we're gonna give it everything we've got. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Maggie Rittenhouse, who's gonna take, take us through the bill itself. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Marty, I see your hand. We're gonna, is it okay if we hold till Q&A later? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Maggie Rittenhouse. I've met, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I have been a volunteer with uh, Common Power since, I guess, 2018 and led a team to Virginia and just recently joined as a full-time employee. So thank you for being part of my second week on the job. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about um, HR1, I'm sure many of you are pretty familiar, but we wanted to run through really what the, what the bill stands for and why it's so important. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see that? Is that good? See the agenda? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Oops, sorry. So thinking about before I get to what HR1 is, there's really three big buckets. I mean, there are an amazing amount of provisions in this bill. It's huge. So let's talk about in three big buckets. The first one is that it makes voting simpler, safer, and fairer, which I think we can all get behind. Um, it breaks down barriers to voting, expands voting rights, and actually ensures that our voices are heard. Um, there, again, there's like a laundry list of 40, 45 provisions within it, but I'm gonna highlight a few. Um, it promotes or requires in all states, so this is what David's talking about, that it's a federal override of what states are doing. It requires automatic voter registration. It requires online and same day registration, expands early voting access, and it simplifies uh, absentee voting. So there's a whole set of provisions that just make it easier to register and actually vote. Then there's all of those voter suppression, additional voter suppression tactics like voter purges and also excluding people, returning citizens from being able to vote. It actually requires that people, once they have served their time, they're actually able to vote again and that voter purges are, are illegal. And my, like my, I guess my, the thing that is most meaningful to me is that it bans, or one of the things that stands out is that it bans partisan gerrymandering, which as David said, the Supreme Court pretty much threw their hands up and said that we can't do anything about that. And we know that partisan gerrymandering undermines the power of people and means that, you know, that our legislators are actually picking their voters rather than the other way around. Um, so there's independent redistricting commissions that are put in place to be sure that it's not led by partisan interests. It doesn't address state gerrymandering, um, but it does at least at the federal level for congressional and Senate seat, or congressional seats. The second big bucket is getting big money out of politics. Um, and so it removes the influence of big money and increases transparency. 
So one of the big things is a real, obviously dark money and within uh, with Citizens United, where we don't know who is giving money where, and we don't know who is actually funding advertising. It requires disclosure of all of that information so we can actually see who's trying to influence us. It creates a small donor focused um, public financing system, which is really innovative. It actually doesn't use taxpayer payer dollars. It uses a fund from white collar criminals who um, when they get money from those that they're using that to actually fund a small donor match system, which is really interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about that and then strengthens oversight of campaign finance law overall. And there's a lot of other provisions sitting under that under big money. Then the third big area is holding public officials accountable. There are a laundry list of things in this too, but I think some things that were that probably resonate with a lot of you given what has been in the news lately. Um, it bans Congress members from serving on corporate boards. It requires presidents to disclose their tax returns, which we know has just been a norm rather than an actual requirement. It gives teeth to federal ethics oversight laws. And then it, I, one of my favorite ones was about the US Supreme Court actually putting ethics, judicial code of ethics for those um, for those uh, leaders. So there's a lot more under that, but those are the three big buckets about making voting simple, getting money out of politics, and then trying to hold our elected officials to a higher standard. Um, so before we go into any more detail on HR1, I do want to talk quickly about HR4, which is the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. So this has been pulled out of HR1, and I just wanted to speak to that so that you guys know why. Um, this, this piece of legislation actually um, it reestablishes the preclearance process that was, was wiped out in the 2013 Shelby versus Holder case. So prior to that, the Voting Rights Act had said that any state that had a history um, and there was some amount of history of um, voter suppression tactics and ways that were discriminatory on voting, any change in their laws around voting had to be pre-cleared with the US Justice Department. So this bill comes in to say, we need to set up a new pre-clearance approach. Now, the reason this bill is sitting outside of HR1, HR1 says that they're commit that they want to, they're committed to uh, passing HR4, but what it does is it actually creates a, a hearing and a record so that there can be people to come in and talk about the voter suppression taxes that are happening across all states, what David just referred to, the number of bills that are being um, put out there to actually suppress votes, and so that there could be a public record, which then can go into be to inform which states need to go in this pre-clearance um, group. It also obviously is uh, honors originally the Voting Rights Act and John Lewis. And so many of the sponsors asked that it could be pulled out separately. So we'll be supporting this too, but it is not like, like it's not, it's not a sub part of HR1. Um, so then the next part, I think that what was really the, the coalition, which we'll talk about that we're joining and help doing some of this work with, they, um, they gave a presentation a few days ago that was really real, just a really profound, um, summary of what HR1 will do. And one of the biggest things they talked about is voting justice is racial justice. We know that we know that at Common Power and we know that's an important part of why we're fighting for this, but they gave a bunch of data to show how these provisions, some of these provisions will actually increase the power of black and brown communities around the country. And so I wanted to share a few of those so you can understand kind of to feel in real time what it means for these, to, if this bill passed. So the first area, and don't get caught up, the slide, their slides are a little bit busy, but I'll, so I'll talk through it. So don't worry if you can't see the exact words on this. Um, so we know that voter registration was put in place to actually stop people from voting, specifically black and brown, young immigrants, working class people. And so that legacy of registration shows up in the data. So you can see if over here to the right, 71% of people who identify as white are registered, 64% of those who are black, 54% Latinx and 53% Asian American. So we have a huge, we have a disproportionate number of just people on the voter rolls, which we know trickles down into people being able to vote. So we're gonna talk about two provisions and how they would affect the black and brown vote um, and the ability to actually have their voices heard. The first one is around automatic voter registration. So this looks at, so HR1 says that people have to be able to automatic or they'll automatically be registered online if they're eligible to vote. Um, 
So in Oregon, this data from Oregon is really interesting, is that after they implemented automatic voter registration, which is ABR, um, in 2016, they saw a significant uptick in the number of black and brown voters on their rolls, and they saw the largest increase in voting, 64% um, to 68% of any state between 2012 and 2016. And of the people that were, auto, through, were registered through automo automatic voter registration, 15% of them were people of color. Whereas if you look at the orange one over here, only 6% of people who registered through other means, not through automatic voter re registration, were people of color. So this is a huge move towards actually making registration not, obviously not a deterrent to being, or not an obstacle to being able to vote. The second one is same day registration. And I thought this was really upsetting data, but to say that this, this data actually says, how many Americans report missing the registration deadline when they try to vote? 11% of uh, people, uh, Black people, 11% are Latinx, and only 3% are white. So this, the idea that we have this pre-registration deadline that people don't know about is just another hurdle that gets put up that HR1 would tear down. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to talk about before I show you this, that um, Mondaire Jones, if anybody's familiar with him, he was um, a legislator who was elected in New York 17th district um, this last um, election cycle. Um, he came and spoke to the, to the coalition, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, and it was, he talked about how he's a, he is the uh, only, he was one of two openly gay black men for the first ever to be elected to Congress. And he talks about how everyone talks about his, uh, his candidacy and his win as improbable, as that it was unlikely. And he, de he described how he grew up in New York in Section 8 housing with a single mom. And that by being able to go to Harvard and then to law school, he was able, he actually was able to get the training that he needed and he decided to run for office. But when he decided, sorry, I have a child. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, it's my husband's birthday tomorrow. So apparently they're bringing cards. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Apologies, they're not supposed to be up here. Um, so anyway, uh, so when he, when, uh, but when he decided to run in a congressional district, he said, the only way that I could do that is I have to raise a boatload of money. So the only way to be competitive is to be going around doing fundraisers all the time. And there's no way he could hold down a job. So he quit his job and he focused on running. But the only reason he could focus on running was because he had saved money when he was a corporate lawyer for two years. And he's like, had that not happened, there is no way that he would have actually been able to run and be competitive. And so I think that speaks to the fact that the small donor matching, which HR1 promotes, which allows that for small grassroots donations, it is a seven times match for them so that people aren't spending all their time trying to raise money and they actually can fund their campaign. So I thought that was a really compelling story about how important how we fund campaigns is. Um, they actually also shared some data around, I thought you guys would find this interesting about Seattle. So the democracy dollar vouchers, what the success of that looked like in terms of who participated in giving and how that impacted who ran. So this first, um, this was in the in 20, the 2017 cycle, they saw a 46% increase in the number of donations that came from areas in Seattle that were majority uh, black and brown. There was a four times increase in the number of people of color who ran um, for the open city council seat compared to the past. And then there was almost a 40% increase in first time donors. So these, these programs around financing, they might be sound a little bit dry, but they're incredibly important in increasing the number of people who are actually representative of our country to actually run and to be participating in giving and influencing our um, elected officials. So the thing I want to leave with you before I pass it on to, to Kylie um, was what they left us with, uh, the, uh, the coalition saying that these policies on their own are super powerful, but when they're put into this package, they're transformative and they will lead to a racially equitable, not fully, but much better than an inclusive democracy. And I think that's why, I hope that's why we're all doing the work that we're doing for this and why we're excited to be doing it. Um, so I am going to pass it over to Kylie. Let me stop sharing Kylie um, and let you share a little bit about why you're in this work. 
Thanks, Maggie. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here with all of you tonight. Um, even though I can only see one Zoom screen, I know we have a lot of folks here. Um, and so good to see familiar and new faces. Um, for those who don't know me yet, my name is Kylie. I use she, her pronouns, and I am CP's new national coordinator. Um, I'm so thrilled to be leading this advocacy effort. And in, in a little minute, you'll hear how to do this work. But first, I think it's really important for us to reflect on why we're doing this work. Um, my fascination with the concept of rights began at a young age. Um, I distinctly remember sitting in my fifth grade teacher's room, combing through an abridged version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I did not understand every word, but I understood the concept. And that was that every single person got this list. And I felt different after reading it. Um, and now I would argue that I became more powerful with that knowledge. Um, unfortunately, as we know, there is an uglier side to rights as well when they're taken away. My senior year of high school, I wrote a paper on Texas's voter identification laws, um, which we mentioned a little bit earlier, and that's one form of many of voter suppression. And like any good student in my paper, I addressed possible solutions. But honestly, I felt pretty powerless as a 17 year old sitting thousands of miles away. Um, but for now, nearly four years later, we have the opportunity to make one of my suggestions possible, federal legislation. But my why isn't just about fulfilling this paper, it's about restoring the power to fellow human beings. And that's why I'm especially ecstatic that our task is to encourage folks to reach out to their representatives, a right that they might not have exercised otherwise. Your why may be similar to mine or completely different, but whatever it is, it brought you here today to common power. So if you can bring your why, then we can bring the work. And I really hope to see you on a phone bank. Thank you. Thanks, Kylie. Wait, hold on. That's like a, that's like a new saying right there. If you can bring your why, we can bring the work. That is amazing. Whoa! Amazing. Oh, that was sweet. That was really good. That's that's gonna go on a t-shirt. Also, slight sidebar. Uh, I'm just really impressed by the polish and professionalism tonight. The slides are great. David, yours is satisfactory. It's good. It's good. Kylie, amazing. So far, we're doing really well. We're at Five thirty. Great job, everybody. Thanks for the check-in and pep talk. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Kylie, for sharing. I think that obviously, as we think about all this work, we have to have we have to know why we're in it. I appreciate you sharing. Um, I'm going to share just a little bit about the coalition that we're joining. Um, let me share my slide one more time. Okay. And I know I saw I saw some questions in the chat. Um, once I get done with this, I'll I'll address some of those. The seven to one matching that my understanding is that that is the small donor matching fund. It wasn't just that was not in place for Mondaire Jones. Um, so I'll get I can get some more details on that too. Um, so the coalition that has is um, that we've been talking about and that we're getting our work through is called the Declaration for American Do Democracy. It goes, for short, it's DFAD, DFAD. Um, and so we've joined that organization. There's over 170 different groups that have joined, like leading names. I think David included that in the email um, that have been working on this work with the Brennan Center as part of it. There's many organizations that are doing this work. Um, they, they started in 2018 um, with the goal of taking back our democracy and restoring the power to the people. They came up with a set of demands of what democracy really should be. And a lot of that is showing up in HR1, the revised version. Um, they're working in many different ways to move Congress members. They kind of have an inside and an outside game. And by inside, I mean, there's lobbying that's happening, taking place, there's policy papers and agendas they're doing. Um, they're working with organizations to send letters to editors. Um, and then they also have a grassroots game. And that's what we're gonna talk about. And that's where we, we come in um, with all of you. Um, is looking at how can we actually put pressure on local officials to uh, to pass the bill, um, and so we'll, you'll learn. There's a website. D, I will, I'll put it in the chat afterwards. So you're welcome to kind of poke around. We have a few of their resources 
on our website, which Kylie is going to walk through. But it's a really amazing organization that's kind of building a campaign around democracy form, reform. So they've got HR1, they'll move into HR4, and they'll also do HR51, which is a DC statehood. So there's a series of things that they're working on. And so we're really honored and excited to be part of this coalition to move it forward. So that's a little bit about that. I'm going to um, then I'm going to pass it over to you, Kylie. I'll go to your slide and then you can um, share uh, on the website about the details. That sounds good. Perfect. Thanks, Maggie. Um, all right, everyone. So now what we've all been waiting for, right? The work. Uh, so this phone banking, like I said, um, we're going to be connecting constituents to their representatives in target districts. So we're making calls, most of which are going to be concentrated in Virginia, but we do have um, a representative in Florida that we're going to be calling to. Uh, but these are going to take place Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays at 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, so our phone banks, actually, let's start. I think I'll start with the website now. That might just be the best. Um, so I'm just going to show you all exactly how to do this. So can everyone see my screen? Yeah, OK. Cool. Thanks, Charles. Awesome. Um, so right up here at the top, we have our advocacy tab. Um, so we're just going to go right there. And these will also be up on our events page as well, our, our phone banks. Um, but just so everyone knows, Mondays, Thursdays, Saturdays. So it'll be really reliable. Um, so when you drop to our page, you're going to get a little bit Kind of what we talked about the bill and our partner organization that we're working with like maggie mentioned um and so our phone banks are not hosted by cp they're going to be hosted by another coalition member um it's common cause but we are going to be meeting as a group like we always do ahead of time um and so if there's any folks who've done um, like North Carolina Action Days, it is going to be a really similar setup where we'll have our Zoom and then we're going to hop over to a different Zoom, um, but we're going to walk our way through it and I'm going to be there the whole time. So it really will be us and then we're going to just join another group of, of volunteers. And so the first thing that you're going to have to do is register for these phone banks. So as I mentioned, we're not hosting them and so you'll go onto our website scroll down to key steps and find which day works best for you. All the same time, 3 p.m. Pacific. Um, and then you can join our Zoom half an hour beforehand uh, just to connect if you have any questions, if you wanna um, just talk about the work, uh, we'll be there to just gather in community. Um, and then we'll head over to Common Cause where we'll get our phone banking training um, just so folks have a little bit of better idea of what they're looking at. Um, we're going to be using a hub dialer. So um, that is a pretty familiar system if you've done phone making before, but it's an automatic dialer. So it'll be really efficient. Um, we're connecting to constituents who are considered activists. So they're active in their community. Um, and so these calls likely will be pretty friendly, pretty easy. Um, and so yeah, you'll just hop on, hang out with us for a little bit, and then make some calls. Um, I think that. Hey, Kylie, can you pop? Uh, go to the events tab there. Oh yeah. So uh, Betty actually scrambled and got all of them up on the website right before this. Oh my gosh, Betty! Thank you so much. <laughs> so there's the launch, and then right below AJ's, which quick plug for that yes. tomorrow, AJ's lunch and learn. Check that out on the website, but there's the first phone bank the day after. Beautiful. Thursday, Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. I will be hanging out and I hope to see you all there. Charles, are those going to be up there every uh, every day? Or every day? Oh, yeah. Every single one is up there. Betty got to, she put them all up there. So that first registration link is how you get registered. And then if you click into there, that view event button, um, you'll see the Zoom link where you can join Kylie at 2.30 and she'll walk you over. It's like a field trip. You know, you start at your classroom and then you, you go over to the, to the trip together. That's how it's going to be. Exactly. Um, 
So I think that I will stop sharing there. Hey, really quick, somebody asked. So we're calling constituents to ask them to call their legislator. Can you just, that last piece is really cool. It's different than the phone banks we've been doing so far. Yeah, no, that is good. And definitely something to highlight and something I'm really, really excited about. So instead of, if folks participate in our last advocacy initiative, that was us reaching out to um, elected representatives. This is like kind of like a in between of like our get out the vote and our advocacy last time. And so we're calling voters, we're calling people, we're not calling reps. And then we are asking those folks to call their representatives. If that makes sense. Yeah. Are we asking them or are we doing it live? So we are not on the phone. If they would like to do it automatically, we can patch them through and send them directly to their rep. Um, but if not, you can send them similarly, like after phone bank, send them information later to do so. Um, but no, we're, we're just connecting them. We're kind of like a, just like a touch point before they head in. Okay. So let's, let's walk it through. Hi, let's do this. Okay. So I'm, you're calling me. Okay. Okay. You want me to Hello. Hi there. Hi, is this David? Yes. Who's this? Hi, this is Kylie. I hope your day is going well. Um, I'm a volunteer with- Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hold on, his dog's barking, hold on. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just, I'll get your dinner, just a second. Okay, go ahead. Oh man, is that how you talk to your dog? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a volunteer with Common Cause, a nonprofit organization fighting for equal and fair government. I'm just calling today because Congress will soon vote on HR1 the largest and boldest democ democracy bill in modern day history. It includes automatic voter registration, a ban on gerrymandering, and requires the president to disclose their taxes. Oh my because, gosh. Yeah. Wow. Right? Yeah. I know. Like common sense. Anyway, your Congress member, Representative X, supported this bill in 2019, and we want to make sure they support it now, and it has a chance of passing with this new administration. Are um, you willing right now to call your congressperson to thank them and urge them to support HR twenty or HR one in twenty twenty one? So Congress Representative Pramila Jayapal supported it. Yes, she did. That's yeah. great. Okay, yeah. so what do you, you what do you want what do you want me to do exactly? Because I I'm, what she did you supported say? in twenty nineteen, but we just want to make sure that your congressperson still will support this bill in twenty twenty one. Okay, what are you asking me to do? Because I'm kind of busy here. What are you asking me to do? I. I'm just asking you, if I click this button right here, I will connect you to your congressperson's office and then you can just, uh, that will provide you a script and then you can ask them to support each, 20, each one. You can do that right now? What is this, some yeah. crazy technology? What is this? This is witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to say that. I don't Kidding. think we want to say that. <laughs> this is just technology. Oh, really? So you can connect me right now if like you're going to, okay. All right, but you know what? Uh, okay, that's option A. Option B is like, I don't have time to do that right now. What's the, what's the... Okay, no, I totally understand. There are so many ways that you can help protect our democracy. You can call your rep later, later if you'd like, or if you'd like to, you can also write a letter to the editor. Would you like to do either of those options? Uh, sure, how do I do that? Because I love to write letters to the editor. Oh, fantastic. Well, if you, I could just get your email right now, then I can send over the tool to you. Okay. All right. That's great, Kylie. Thank you for doing that with me, that little role play there. That's really great. So you're going to call me up. I'm the voter and you're going to, you're going to know my name. You're going to have the script. You're going to know my representative's name too, right? That's going to be there. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And all of these questions that people might have about the specifics, that's why you're going to have a, a half hour before Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that half hour before. What's that all about? So half hour before, there's really not anything that you need to bring or know ahead of time. Um, we're just going to come in and chat. Uh, we'll get to know each other too before we head over to the other Zoom. But it's really just a place that if you have any questions or if you just want to hang out with some fellow CPRs, um, it's just an opportunity to gather as our group because we will be making phone calls as Common Cause volunteers that's our partner organization so that should be kind of a familiar switch in in our heads 
Okay. Hey, Maggie. Yeah, let, let me let me speak to that for one second, because I, I people, somebody else asked if they can just join at three, and um, of course, of course, you could just join at three and make calls. And uh, you know, folks who are in this event right now, looking around, wondering how we got 150 people, 150 people that come to this event. Um, it's it's because we like each other. It's because we, we, like, people come for the work. They do. They come to make calls, but they stay for the faces that are on the screen. That's why a bunch of folks have their cameras on. Those 30 minutes, those 25 minutes, actually, uh, it's it's no time at all, and it's totally worth your time to participate in that if you can. And maybe you don't need something from it. Maybe you're like, I just want to make calls. I don't need to see anybody. I feel motivated. I feel connected to the community. Maybe someone else needs to see you, especially if you're that gung-ho about calling. Maybe they need to hear from you. So maybe you don't come for you. Maybe you come for someone else in the room. I would love for you to come for that reason. And please, if for nobody else, come for Kylie. Because if she's there by herself, I will be very disappointed if no one's there with her. Support her. Thanks, Charles. Um, so, Meg, I mean, uh, uh, Kylie, I don't need to know anything other than to sign up for a call bank and come to that Zoom. That's it. That is it. Really? I don't need to know the rep. I don't need to know the script. None of that. Mm -mm. You will learn everything there. Okay. All right. But if folks would like, I believe that there is a, a copy of the, of the script um, to look at ahead of time, because I know that the folks like to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Maggie, is there anything else about the bill itself or anything that we should hit on? There's a few questions in the chat that we can address, but I don't know if you want to go ahead and play your last thing. Um, okay. I shall. And then, we can, and then we can take those. I have, them, I have them written down so we can answer those. Okay, great. I'm going to play a three minute clip then from John Lewis in March 2019, which is when HR1 from the last Congress was introduced from the last House of Representatives. Um, and it was passed. And it is only tweaked a little bit. It is very similar to that bill, but it is made even stronger now. Okay, it's even more impactful. So I want to play from uh, the words of, you know, John Lewis on the House floor about this bill. And I'm gonna drop in the chat a little bit while, in a little bit of time the link to that's what you're seeing right now. Come on, come on. There we go. All right. The gentleman, the gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Madam Speaker. I rise in strong support of HR1, and I urge each and every one of our colleagues to support this bill. Madam Speaker, you have heard me say on occasion that the right to vote is precious, almost sacred. In a democratic society, it is the most powerful, nonviolent instrument or tool that we have. In my heart, or hearts, I believe we have a moral responsibility to restore access for all of our citizens who desire to participate in the democratic process. Many people marched, protested for the right to vote. Some gave a little blood, others gave their very lives. This weekend, many of our colleagues traveled with us to Alabama, to Birmingham, to Montgomery, and to Selma. They saw the signs in the museums that said white only, color only. They visited the First Baptist Church in downtown Montgomery, where we feared for our lives as the mob waited outside to attack and kill us. They stood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, crossing the Alabama River, where we were beaten, trampled, tear gassed by attempting to march from Selma to Montgomery to dramatize the need for voting rights. Madam Speaker, 
You have heard me tell the story before, and you know our work is not finished. It makes me sad. It makes me feel like crying when people are denied the right to vote. We all know that this is not a Democratic or Republican issue. It is an American one. For the past few days, I listened to the debate on this bill. I spent some time having what I call an executive session with myself. The words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to mind. He would often say, the dark of the moral universe is so long, but it been toward justice. The vote is an opportunity to be on the right side of history. It is a chance to cast a vote by the people, of the people, and for the people. So I ask you, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? The time has arrived to tear down the barrier to the ballot box. Today, we are able to do our part in this long fight for the very soul of our nation. Let's save our nation the gentleman's and redeem time has expired. the soul of America. Thank you very much. So I just want to say that we can only do our part and have a shot, a chance to pass this because of the elections that were just held. We did all that work and millions of Americans did everything they could to have this shot, this chance. There are many more hurdles to get over, but we got a chance. We got a shot, folks. We're gonna go. Maggie, you got it. Okay, thanks. Hard to follow, John Lewis. Um, People want your link, David. To speaking of John, yeah, they, yeah, they they want the link. Everybody wants the link to that um, to that clip. Um, and Barbara, I saw your note. We did already talk about it. Get, get involved, Kylie. Could you put the link to the um, to the web page in the chat um, to share with Barbara? Um, so there are a few questions that came up, and I don't have to answer all of them, David, Charles, Kylie. If you want to jump in, but I'm just going to highlight them. And if I forgot, if I missed some, just please re put it in the chat. Um, one question was from Paul, which I think was a, is a totally fair one. He said about being in a group of 170 in coalition rather than kind of following the lead of our partners on the ground. Um, so want to speak to the democracy. So this is a this is a federal level level initiative, um, which is hard for any individual state actor to do, particularly. And so it was formed in the idea that all of these national orgs and some state-based orgs could come together and work towards pushing the legislation. Um, and they're the premier group that we have found is actually doing on the, well, on the ground virtual work to get involved. Um, and so that is why we have joined. It is informed by local organization. There's an Arizona-based organization who is focusing on calling their representatives. So they're part of our, the grassroots coalition uh, committee that meets weekly. So we are hearing from the actual orgs themselves about what their priorities are, but they have come together under the umbrella of this kind of campaign for democracy. Um, we will continue, I just want to reiterate, we will continue to work with our state partners. We have a call with New Virginia Majority on Friday to talk about what does our relationship look like? How can we support them? So that does not preclude us from supporting our organizations, but given that we're in this window, which has been a question, like this window of time on HR1, we wanted to get started and be able to actually do some work. And the co this coalition was the best um, was the best group that um, we have been able to find to do the work with. Um, if, I hope that answers the question, Paul, and sufficiently. Um, uh, the timeline, there was a question about the timeline for this. Um, I'm, I'm telling you the best information I have from the coalition is that obviously there's a lot going on. You might have noticed an impeachment. You might have noticed a COVID relief bill. So a lot of things have been taking, obviously, HR1 is the first bill and it's SR1, that's symbolic to say it is the first bill um, that named the first bill. But the, they, the expectation right now is that there are the votes in the House. I think they have 218 on the record Dems who want to support it. Who we're calling are the wobbly Dems. That's the Virginia and Florida Dems that voted in 2019 um, or 2018, I guess. Um, 
and the, or maybe it was 2019, sorry, when it, when it passed in the last Congress or 2018 Congress, but they voted when there was nothing on the line. It was never going to go anywhere. So right now it's kind of stiffening the spines of those Democrats so that they can have everybody voting. So that's who we're calling. So the idea is that what they're, what the coalition is thinking is that the, it will come up in the house late February, early March, and then obviously it's going to go over to the Senate. And that's a whole, like all of your concerns about filibuster, like all of that is real. Like there is a huge question. There are not the Republican votes to get HR1 passed. Um, so it's going to take some sort of change to the rules to get it passed. But we're going to be working with the coalition to understand what pressure points we can apply to Democrats to be able to get the rule change. And there, there'll be more talk about that. They're talking about their position on the filibuster and how they want to um, how they want a message around it and how they want, they do not want an arcane Jim Crow relic to be stopping legislation on the Democratic front. So there will be more work around that, but I don't have the details yet. So right now we're kind of just putting one foot in front of the other of trying to fortify the house to get it passed as strongly as we can. And then we'll start working on the other stuff that comes up in the Senate. Um, and it takes a majority, only takes a majority in the house to pass it, but then theoretically in the Senate because of Again, the filibuster, which is ridiculous, um, shouldn't be there. It would take 60 votes if they if the Republicans filibuster it, which we assume they would, um, unless they change the rules of what can pass without with that is not subject to the filibuster, or they stop like they kill the filibuster overall. And I saw a plug for Kill Switch. Someone put that in here about the uh, about the Senate. I've heard that's an amazing book and I, I follow that guy all the time. So highly recommend if you wanna learn more about the Senate procedures that go there, it's a good, a good one. Hey, um, uh, Kylie, yeah. I saw you answer a question or two in here. You wanna say those out loud for everybody? Yeah, sure. I think that the only one really is just what states we're gonna be calling into, um, which are Virginia and Florida. Okay, but that could shift over time, right? That's what right. you're saying. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So these are just the the key um, districts that we've been asked to call right now. Mm -hmm. And right now we don't have texting opportunities. This is calling. Um, it's a good question for the um, for the co the grassroots coalition. There's a meeting tomorrow. We can ask about that. But right now it's just using that hub dialer to actually have a face to face or not face to face, but an actual conversation with someone and ask them to make the call and pass them through. Um, but as, as opportunities come up, we will be sharing those. Um, it's a little bit in the early stage of the grassroots work. Hey, Maggie, I'm going to jump in with a couple things too, okay? Yeah. Uh, so some people have asked, should we be calling or contacting rep uh, representatives who might be not for sure going to pass it? Okay. And uh, should we be calling them? Um, actually, as I understand it, we have more than enough votes in the Democratic controlled house to pass this bill from people who already voted in 2019 to support it. So we're just trying to get those 2019 folks to make sure they vote again to support it. And we're starting with some of the potentially uh, most ones most likely to maybe peel off because they are in, they're in really competitive districts. So is that correct that we've already got enough votes, we just need to get these folks to stay with their vote? If everybody who voted for it in 29 or yeah, 20, whatever, I'm sorry, I'm like getting my, new, year, yep. it was 20, yeah, 2019, if everyone voted the same way, we, it would pass in the house. But there's people who have not gone on the record, like Abigail Stanberger in Virginia, Elaine Lurie, Luria or Lurie, so there, and, and Kylie has that list, there's like six or seven people, Virginia and Florida, who have not committed to voting for it. So that's who, so we're calling activists or voters in those districts and asking them to put pressure on. And I saw something in the chat, what happens, what literally happens is every day, those legislators, their offices tally up the number of calls that come from their constituents about certain issues. So that is a huge driver of what they care about and what they focus on. So we're driving calls into them from their constituents to, be, to make it a high priority for that legislator. So uh, everybody, we are trying to get Democrats to pass a Democratic bill. If we can't get that done, then we got much bigger problems, okay? And that's certainly possible. We might not, but, we can, but that's our first goal. Then we need to get it, then we worry about the Senate. And I know many of you are like, what about the filibuster? And can we get these votes? We will get there in due time. We will get there in due time. We will be working hard to pressure the Senate. We will. They're kind of busy this week, 
So we're not focusing on them right now, okay? We're gonna get there in due time. Let's just focus right now on what is available to us, which is to get these Dems to pass a democratic bill. Yeah, so, so just to comment on that for a second, we are we are at the very beginning of this campaign there. If you go to the website for DFAD, there's a bunch of stuff that we're we're showing you that she showed it, that Maggie showed in her slides that uh, we're going to get involved in it. It's not even on their website yet. So we are CP is kind of stepping up our game. And instead of tweeting at and emailing through the, the retail intakes for uh, senators and Congress people, we're joining a coalition that's got a, a broad strategy. And this is just the first part of it. Um, the, the only thing that we missed before this was a tweet storm or something that happened in January. So this is the first grassroots effort um, to on mass, like across these 170 plus organizations that that's taken action this year, but it's not the last. We're going to see an evolution of this. You're going to see more of this over the, in the news over time. Um, this is just the beginning. Okay, here's another thing. Some of you are asking about what about the state actions that are occurring in a Georgia and in Arizona or they're trying to do it in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Right, we are, we are out there scouring opportunities to do state-based work. Our partner orgs have not issued the call yet. They have not. Okay, we, Charles and I were on a phone call today with our Arizona partners and that th they, they, they think they've got it in pretty good shape in Arizona, okay? So there's nobody like blowing the horn for us to come right now at the state level. What is out there is this federal bill, this federal bill. And some of you ask, how does a federal bill override state actions? Well, the way it works is that federal law controls on federal elections. So what federal elections do we have? We have a president, a Senate, and a, and a House of Representatives. Those are federal elections. So federal law controls on federal elections. So you go back and look at uh, the Voting Rights Act, you go back and look at the, uh, the, some of the amendments that were passed during the uh, Civil Rights Movement, the 24th, which outlawed poll taxes, go back to the 17th Amendment, which uh, uh, put into place direct election of US senators. These are federal laws for federal elections. So this, this does carry the day on federal elections. And the hope slash belief is that if you put into place early voting, you put into place automatic voter registration, you put into place widespread polling locations, that that's just gonna swamp any of the state resistance on the state elections, okay? So we are operating in the space where there is a need for us, where there is a set of action. Kylie is ready to go. She is waiting, like she's already on the Zoom call for Thursday. She is ready to meet you there to get this going, okay? Maggie, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, Kylie, tell us a little bit about you went yesterday and how you think we're gonna make a difference when we show up. Yeah, no, that's a great um, question, David. So yesterday I got to join in just to see how logistically the phone banks are being run. Um, I will tell you that if everyone in this room showed up to their phone bank, it would probably blow their minds. Um, I was on the phone bank with about five folks. Um, and so I'm really excited to bring the common power um, boots to their ground and, and help support their work. Cause I think that we're really needed there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're a force for sure. <laughs> and then I just also wanna read out loud um, the dates and times. So just as a reminder, Monday, Thursday, Friday, 3 p.m. is when phone banking starts and then 2.30 uh, you can meet us or meet me on the CP Zoom. If you wanna hang out. <laughs> All right, if you got more questions, pop them in the chat. We're kind of in the latter stages here. Terry wants to download an app. Is there an app you got to download for this? Kylie? An app? No. Yeah, no app, Terry, sorry. 
Terry, you asking for app suggestions from the community though? Are you are you uh, like some to get you through COVID? You bored? No. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I, I think someone put in the chat the wrong information. Okay. It's Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Mondays, Thursdays, Saturdays. Um, and the Monday one only is for the next two Mondays. And then the other two, the Thursdays and Saturdays are running through mid-March. Um, we obviously will add those to those as we learn more. But right now, again, like one foot in front of the other, like that's what's set up for now. And so we'll join those. Look, the best thing to do is to not try to remember all this stuff in the chat, not try to copy it down, just go straight to the website. If we've got a day, it'll be on the calendar. If we change it, that'll be on the calendar. Go to the events tab. It'll all be there. Look at Therese. Therese code here. She's a she's a, a, a veteran CPA. You see what she's doing? She's not she doesn't need to write down notes. She doesn't need to check for links. She's just hanging out and being in community. You know why? Because she knows it's all on the site. It's on the tab. It's cool. It's cool. Trust Kylie, 2.30. Kylie will tell me when to be there, right, Therese? Yeah, I'm going to be there every single Zoom call, even if I don't make the phone calls, just so I can see Kylie. See? That's what I'm can't talking about. Kylie withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what you're talking about. <laughs> um, right. And I'll just, uh, last thing I was just going to say, there is a resources section on the website that has like an overview of HR1 um, and some other documents. And I saw a question about like the actual full bill. I'll add that in tonight too. So that there's some things that if you want to get up to speed and be, you know, more ready to have those conversations, you don't have to do that, but they'll be on the site too. There's a link to DFAD there in case you want to learn more about this coalition that we joined and see all the other organizations that are there. Yeah. So this is the beginning of our, our advocacy work in 2021. The, the advocacy work we're going to do this year around this legislation, HR 4, HR 51, is that what the uh, DC statehood is? We will be working for DC statehood as well. Um, <clears throat> And the Senate, the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill is S-1. This, these HR-1 and S-1s don't mean they have to be taken up first, but they, they are filed first and they, are, they symbolize the, the priorities of the Congress, okay? This is the beginning of our work this year. We are gonna do a lot of advocacy work around these bills, around getting rid of the filibuster, around uh, doing all we can for voting rights. We worked to be able to have this chance, all right? So thank you all. Um, we will have voter field work down the road. Virginia will be incredibly important this year. There's a special election coming down the pike in Texas that we're gonna engage in that the date hasn't even been set yet. The representative just passed away yesterday, but it's gonna be a competitive Republican held seat in Texas. Um, but in an odd numbered year, we do more um, around uh, partner work and advocacy work and less straight up election work. Um, so this is, this is the mechanism of action for us. So we really appreciate all your work, all your support. Maggie, Kylie, thank you so much. Charles, you got anything else? Oh, uh, wait, I wanna, uh, Nancy just pointed this out to me. We finally, we're like legit on the page here. This is the, these are all the partners here. This is going to look crazy to people, but these are all the 170 plus member organizations. And Nancy was like, it's good to see you all there. I had to go through this common power right there, baby, right there. You see it <laughs> right next to city. Like, look, Demos is here. Move on is right there. Vote.org is down there and there's common power. That's what I'm talking about. Official. Legit. It's good stuff. Um, okay. We've got the last 99 people here. This is where we get to the bonus. You want to officially close it out with a, a song or anything, David? Cause we're going to get to the bonus, the bonus round here of this event. No, I'm good. You good. Okay. The bonus, the bonus is hey, people come here and, and there's some crazy stuff going on in our government and our country right now. David, what's your, what's your read, man? What's going on on the impeachment so, 
who's going to vote for it? Who's not? Honestly, Come on. This well, I would say two things, three things. One, um, for, for the historical record, it is so valuable to go through this trial, to, to have a chance to lay it out in the congressional record there forever. These allegations that are, well, they're not allegations, these truths, um, and to get a vote on the record of people defending or not defending this former president. So for I'm so glad we're doing this, okay, so glad. Second, if you wanna see what ethical and empathic political leadership looks like, Take a look at Jamie Raskin's words today, his opening, his words, and then his close. All right. This guy. Wow. This is, this is, we have a policy at common power of trying to get really good people elected and then believing that they're going to do the right thing. We've never worked for Raskin. He's in Maryland. He's in a district that doesn't require our help. But if you elect really good people, they make better decisions than bad people. I know that's a really crazy thing, but they do. And so Raskin, what a story, what an incredible amount of pain this man has gone through re recently and just great stuff. So I encourage you to look at Raskin today. Go, go find his videos from today, Jamie Raskin. And third, the, the Trump defense is so bad. The Trump defense attorneys are so bad that they actually lost a Republican vote today in the Senate. They lost a vote. Bill Cassidy just reelected in Louisiana. There ain't many non-Trump votes down there, okay? Uh, voted to move forward with the trial after he had voted last week to not move forward with the trial. And he was interviewed, uh, I believe by Jake Tapper afterwards. I don't know who he was interviewed by. And they said, so you changed your vote, why? And he said, did you listen to the defense? Okay. <laughs> uh, and he said they, they didn't make any sense. They weren't any good. Okay. So this is, uh, this is not the last impeachment, folks. It's not. This is not the one a year ago. This is one in which the soul of the country is at stake. All right. It really is. This guy wants to be president again. He wants to be president again. Um, so... That's my thoughts about impeachment. I, I, I did not expect to be sucked in and pulled in the way I was today. And I was moved by, by the importance of this. And we had a meeting and you said you had to be late because you had to finish watching, watching it. That was, that was, that was a big deal. They had to finish watching uh, C-SPAN. Well, I'll just give you one of Raskin's pieces. This is a gentleman whose son died on New Year's Eve from suicide and is dealing with all of that pain. And as part of the healing process, he brought his daughter and her husband and her, his other daughter, I, I think his other daughter, to the Capitol on January 6th to watch. They were there with him and they got separated. They were in the office with Henny St Steny Hoyer and he was on the floor. And when he got back together with them, he said, as just trying to kind of help the, 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 the fear, he said to his daughter, I think his youngest daughter, you know, next time we come, it won't be like this. And she said, dad, I don't ever want to come back. The capital of our country should not be like that. That should not happen. Nope. Let's make it better. Let's go, people. We got work to do. We got work to do. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Good to see everybody. Kylie, Maggie, David, great job. Well done. Thanks. Thank you.